So he's the chief executive uh, officer of the Commonwealth Games Federation, uh, the organization responsible for the Commonwealth Games and, and much more, which you'll talk about. Uh, they're also in charge of the Commonwealth Youth Games and many other initiatives that inspire Caribbean Commonwealth athletes. This is our 33rd episode and my guest today is David Grevenberg. David was, a, was also the chief executive, was also the executive director of Sport and International Federation Relations at the IPC, which is the International Paralympic Committee, and also Chief Executive of Glasgow 2014, which, which was also a good games for the Caribbean. Uh, he was in charge of that on the organizing committee. Uh, which, David, welcome. Yeah, it's good to be here. How are you, Dalton? I, I, I am great. Listen, so let's start off with some personal. You, you did wrestling. And not track and field, I, eh? I, I did wrestling. I, I was uh, a little bit of track and field. I ran the 400. Uh, my oh, fastest that? time. Uh, 50.03. Uh, 50. <laughs> could, could never break the 50 uh, second mark. So, uh, yeah, I wasn't, I, wasn't, uh, I wasn't too bad. But I think growing, growing up in uh, inner city New Orleans in the, in the yeah. States, you, you, you learn to run a little bit. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, yeah, uh, it, it was uh, it was a good it was a good experience. I played a little bit of American football as well during that time, but uh, I gravitated to wrestling and uh, tried to keep my feet on the ground most of the time, <laughs> which was always important, eh? Absolutely, absolutely. But uh, yeah, it's uh, it, it uh, allowed me to to travel um, both uh, nationally in the states and, and internationally. Um, and really gave me such a, a strong foundation for, you know, a lot of the work I do, I do today um, in terms of kind of respecting everyone and fearing no one. So, <laughs> yeah, but it's a, yeah, it was, uh, it was a, definitely a, a very important chapter in my life. And I do Brazilian Jiu Jitsu now um, because it's a little bit, uh, I would say less explosive than, uh, yeah. than wrestling. And, uh, and <laughs> I'm, I'm half the man I used to be, as my wife would say. Yeah. yeah. All right. Listen, uh, David, uh, in, in preparing for this, obviously, uh, news coming out of the Birmingham 2022 games is that the President Dame Louise Martin has stepped down from that committee. Uh, talk, talk to me about that in relation to some of what CGF wants to do as it relates to diversity. Yeah, I mean, it, it really it really comes down to you know where we've come from uh, as you know as a movement. Um, you know, I would say uh, several years ago, this this uh, uh, series of games, the Commonwealth Games, is one of the second oldest multi sport events in the world next to the, to the Olympics uh, has been uh, happening uh, or, or occurring since 1930 when they were called the uh, Empire Games. Um, right. And uh, it's obviously uh, transformed and is continuing to transform <clears throat> into being um, a movement that looks to uphold peace, sustainability, uh, and prosperity. And, uh, you know, when you start to look at being truly representative and serving uh, the people and communities and nations of the Commonwealth, you have to be both uh, representative um, and respectful. And I think one of the things that uh, was, has been recognized um, is that we probably need to be a bit more prescriptive um, in issues around equality, diversity, uh, and inclusion as we create these games. Uh, we're, we're fortunate in terms of the Federation itself is that we, we have uh, really embraced inclusion and diversity for a number of years, some by some uh, aspects by accident and some by purpose, but certainly over the past probably uh, eight years since the lead up to Glasgow 2014, um, the Federation and the, the movement has become increasingly, uh, I would say, uh, aware of its responsibility uh, to address issues around historical injustice, uh, the reduction of inequality, uh, issues around youth empowerment, strengthening small states and island states, and, and really focusing on uh, urban regeneration and uh, sustainability. And 
really, and that's a unique uh, proposition when you look at the geography and the vast diversity in the geography of the Commonwealth, but yeah. also the very uh, vast uh, demographic and of course our shared history. So all of these points play out when you start to create governance structures, you need to be able to embrace that diversity. And if we're not doing that, we need to make the necessary changes. And Dame Louise made a decision. She says, we need to, to, to walk the talk and, and through her leadership, uh, you know, are, are doing that uh, at the local level uh, with Birmingham 2022. Yeah, I'm gonna come to some more of that, David, but I, but I want to go a bit more into the games. Uh, your report came out, I think, early this year, late last year. I mean, pandemic, let me forget times. Yeah, uh, sure. Talking about the, <laughs> the significance of the games. Uh, how important has this been for you and the Commonwealth Games Federation in not just sports, but for athlete development? I think it's absolutely you know, uh, critical when we start to look at athletes, not just as you know, competitors on the field to play or not treating athletes like racehorses. Mm -hmm. um, and when their time comes, we just, we forget about them and move, uh, move things on. If you look at the whole life cycle from that aspiring stage to that inspiring stage to retiring and thriving in life, mm -hmm. what is our duty of care in respecting and protecting athletes through those transitions. And we are, are, are newly founded, and I say newly founded, it really wasn't until a few years ago that we had a, a, a proper, um, fully Commonwealth-wide represented uh, athletes uh, commission. Uh, we have an athletes advisory commission, which we now have. Um, and we are now uh, I would say for the first time through our new strategy, Transformation 2022, have been uh, really putting the building blocks of how we support uh, athletes to be agents of change, to be ambassadors against uh, discrimination, to, to really use their platform for social change within their communities, but also how we protect their sense of well-being through education and programs and, and just using both the, the games themselves, but the movement as a whole, as a platform uh, for, for voice uh, recognition and, and, uh, and empowerment. And, you know, it's putting those pieces into tangible programs now with our, you know, 72 uh, Commonwealth Games Association, that is the, the phase where we are, we are in. Uh, and, and in that phase, David, what, what are the, I mean, we have talked about this before, but how, how, can, how will the CJF ensure that it remains relevant in a space where there are many other games popping up, uh, whether regional games, whether international games or, or, or tournaments, competitions, which are, which are your competitors? Yeah, I mean, I think what it is, is it's about creating, first of all, it's about creating a, a, a an experience that isn't only positive but is is distinct and unique um, and you know one of the things you know when we, when we when we start to ask people well what what does it mean to you to be a Commonwealth citizen most people will look at you strangely and say well first of all I don't know second of all um, I've never been asked that question and third of all why are you asking that question? <laughs> you know, yeah. um, it, it's it's quite it's quite interesting. So you know, in terms of how do we make the games and this unique, uh, you know, I would say association of nations and people something that is uh, uniquely challenging, but hopeful and empowering at the same time, and that the games and the movement becomes a platform that people can identify with and have a real sense of belonging. That is our challenge. And, you know, I think by, by running into the fire on some of the, the big uh, systemic and salient issues of our time, you know, not just uh, environment, but more social issues um, and being representative and being a, a, an awareness builder an advocate and an action taker, we feel that, you know, we create the place to be um, that if you represent and say that you represent these things, then this is going to be a unique platform, not only for you to, 
to show off your stuff and uh, and emerge through through this as uh, and a champion um, uh, throughout the Commonwealth. But the number of Commonwealth athletes who have won world championships, regional uh, championships, uh, and continental uh, championships uh, and Olympic games is enormous. And, and particularly sports like uh, track and field or athletics, you know, it's, uh, it goes without saying. So we, we feel that we, we put that combination of, you know, being the real deal uh, on the field and being the real deal in life, the way that we put this together, it's, uh, it is fairly distinct and distinct and unique and, and actually talks to people's identity and core. And that's the challenge. And uh, we need to, we need to respect people, but we also need to listen, learn from them, and continue to and continue to empower them. And that's what that's that's the opportunity that we're trying to create. Yeah, listen, I'll talk to you a little bit more, and I feel about you know some of those leadership styles to ensure that this happens. But 2014 was a success for the for the CGF. Uh, 2018 was was huge, and that was my first experience. Uh, 2022, I know is supposed to be a step up, uh, a huge push forward for you. But we've had the pandemic. We have had a pushback for the Tokyo 2020 into 21, well, we, we think. Uh, and, and no, we have games that may clash, well, competition that may clash potentially with the Commonwealth Games. How do you plan for that? And how do you ensure that you still get some of the successes that you, you hope to reap from the games? Yeah, I mean, one of the things, you know, if you look at the, uh, the, the, the world athletics uh, had to obviously move uh, its world championships that uh, originally sp to take place in 2021 in, uh, in Eugene, uh, Oregon, in, in Nike Town. Uh, and, you know, that was, uh, <laughs> that was um, uh, obviously a, a quite a bit of work that we had to, to do with world athletics in terms to avoid and, and minimize the disruption or the cannibalization um, of the two events. And what we've been able to do is really find a, a, a window of time and a unique uh, proposition um, where many athletes will be able to hit a treble in terms of uh, you know if they're if they're if they're competing in either diamond league events um, or competing in uh, uh, European Championships or or or, 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 or other events, the, the ability to be crowned world champion, Commonwealth champion, European champion, or you know diamond uh, diamond league champion, all within the same year, uh, we really feel that that is an enormous enormous unprecedented opportunity and challenge for some of these athletes to be able to, to take that and, and put that. Now we recognize that some events are easier to do that than others and, and we need to be really sensitive and realistic to that. But in terms of both an experience and opportunity in terms of platform, you know, uh, not dissimilar to Glasgow um, and, and I think the timing of the, of the event is critical. We, we have all the confidence in the world that sports like athletics and, 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 and some of the other sports, we, know, we now also have women's T20 cricket uh, yeah. coming, on to the, <laughs> coming on to the program. You know, it's going to be interesting to see which team from the Caribbean makes it um, and how that emerges. Look, this is going to be something new, different, fun, engaged. The diversity of Birmingham is definitely going to create um, a... Uh, a home away from home experience for, for much of the Commonwealth and that definitely the Afro-Caribbean uh, community in Birmingham is, you know, is so rich and, 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 you know, I think it's going to be a lot of fun. Um, and, you know, so I, 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 I think athletes are going to want to come. Um, I certainly, uh, I, I certainly want to be there and, and see, and see them enjoy the, enjoy the moment. And, uh, and also with a refurbished Alexander stadium, uh, which has, you know, it's, it's quite iconic in the world of athletics. Um, that, that'll be also a, a fantastic opportunity to see how fast that track goes. So yeah. it'll be fun. And, 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 and our Paralympians are also important in this, aren't they, David? Absolutely. I mean, the, the Commonwealth, uh, that's how I got involved with the Commonwealth Games. You know, originally growing up uh, in the States, you, you don't know much about the Commonwealth, <laughs> uh, other, unless it's uh, Virginia or Massachusetts, you know. So this, uh, this <laughs> I learned um, to really about, about the Commonwealth uh, 
through uh, the Manchester 2022, sorry, Manchester uh, 2002 games where the first fully inclusive para sports program was introduced. Um, the, prior to that, there were a number of kind of exhibition um, opportunities, but in 2002, uh, a new direction for the Federation uh, was, was forged, which included uh, the growth and prominence of para sport in the Commonwealth Games. And what that basically means is that para athletes are full members, fully recognized and, and legitimized as uh, part of their national teams and integrated um, within uh, the sports program. Um, and, you know, and so, you know, what we will have, uh, you know, not a segregated approach, but an integrated approach. Um, and we have the largest para sport program of any Commonwealth Games in Birmingham 2022. So it's been growing from 12 events to now, I think it's, uh, it's, it's over 40 events uh, for, yeah. for Birmingham. So it's really exciting. And, and, it's, and it's aimed at both promoting and growing para sport throughout the Commonwealth. You know, and again, you know, many small states and island states you know, uh, you know, have entire para uh, sport communities that have been really um, you know, underrepresented and, uh, and underdeveloped. And uh, I mean, yeah. Jamaica is one of the strongest uh, Caribbean para sport uh, yeah. communities. And uh, it's, a great, it's a great way to, 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 to have uh, you know, these communities show their stuff, but also focus development um, and, and recognition uh, you know, through, a, through a, yeah. an event like the Commonwealth Games. You, you mentioned Jamaica and the, and the Caribbean, and one of the issues uh, for us in the Caribbean, and going some of, to some of the harder areas now, David, yeah, uh, for, us in the, for us in the Caribbean, the, the Commonwealth represents uh, a part of our past, in a way, that we have struggled with, and, and we interrogate, and sometimes want to forget, how will the CJF and how will your leadership try to address some of these issues, uh, historical as they may be, and in moving forward, help people in the Caribbean to understand that the, the Commonwealth Games does not represent um, repression or, or social injustice? I think you need to address, uh, you know, it, it, does our brand pass the Trenchtown test? Yeah. You know, is, is you know, I think the question, you know, does our brand resonate at all levels of society and the historical truths um, of where uh, empire and colonialism come from? Our brand uh, seeks to be a reparative force for justice um, and has emerged. You know, if you look at the, the modern Commonwealth, there have been a number of milestones, actions, initiatives, and steps to fight for freedom, fairness, equality, and justice. And as a movement that represents the diversity of nations and the diversity of, of, of people um, and the shared history, there's an enormous opportunity for us to build awareness, advocate for, for change and, and take meaningful action through the wonderful power of sport. Um, but it only starts if you're being honest with yourself and honest with others. And I think what, uh, and that's about mutual respect and it's about showing our respect um, and acknowledgement uh, you know, for, uh, for the past and, and as, a, as certainly a, um, as a starting base protecting people um, addressing issues that need to be resolved in terms of conflict and, and healing and trauma. Um, and sport is a wonderful way of, of, of building communities and, 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 having, and being able to have some of these honest conversations. But then it's about promoting people's ambitions and dreams and empowering them in real meaningful action. And, you know, I think we, we started in, in Glasgow, where as a chief executive, we started to really address this and, and your, your, um, your high commissioner at the time who was represented at London came and spoke uh, to Glasgow City um, and, and uh, 
was uh, very forthcoming about uh, the connection between Glasgow and the, and the legacy of slavery. Um, and, uh, you know, that was one of the things I think you, you, can, you can look in, in terms of the, the initiatives that came after, you know, through our cultural program at the Empire Cafe, there was a debate and discussion and, and uh, reflection on the links of Scotland uh, and the legacy of slavery, um, which has led to, you know, for example, the University of Glasgow um, a few years later with the University of the West Indies starting to uh, work on reparative justice initiatives together. Um, it, you know, this is not a walk someone takes by themselves. It's a walk we take together. And I think being a, an organization that may not have all the answers, but certainly has the will and perspective to, to have these conversations and, and discover together how we respect, how we protect, how we promote, and how we empower, and how we use the power of sport as a, as a force to do that with. Well, you know, then, then if that's what you're looking for, the Commonwealth sport movement is, is what's on offer. And, you know, we feel very both confident that we can take all of these wonderful words and bring them into action. And we're doing that. I mean, we had an amazing, uh, a amazing reconciliation action plan in Gold Coast um, and uh, around uh, addressing the atrocities committed against indigenous people. And we, you know, there was a really, and this wasn't about tokenism, this was about genuine engagement and empowerment. You know, it's, uh, you know, and with Birmingham, you know, a huge opportunity because of the diversity of Birmingham around addressing a number of issues, both locally and within within the region, but also I think Commonwealth wide. So, uh, yeah, and it's and this is all within our strategic plan. So, you know, 72 nations and territories. This isn't just uh, me as the chief executive proclaiming this is what we're going to do. This was mandated by 72 nations and territories that agreed and and convened. Um, actually, as close as Montego Bay, where we had our last Caribbean uh, meeting, you know, we forged some of these ideas about how do we not only seek, but be the change uh, we want to be. And, uh, you know, that was, uh, that's a big... Uh, uh, and, I, and I did note that the other members had approved the strategic plan. If you don't mind, David, uh, from that, what we through probably about two of the main important strategies you take from that. I mean, it's a huge document. Well, not huge, but yeah, <laughs> yeah. But but I think there's there's two things. I mean, I think if you if you look at peace building, you know, you can't have sustainable and prosperous communities without peace. Right. And it starts with a respect, protection, and promotion of people's human rights. If you want to build peace, that's where it starts. So issues such as equality, safeguarding. Um, you know, uh, the, 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 all of that is about respecting people's human rights as a fundamental bedrock to building whatever structure you're going to build. And so as part of the, uh, the, the, the strategy is to really, through the Federation itself and its entities, through our organizing committees, through our members, and through uh, Commonwealth governments, those four kind of pillars of, uh, of institutions, working with them to establish a commonwealth-wide uh, human rights strategy through sport. And we're working that, so that's one of the big, uh, you know, that makes sport safe, continues to make sure that sport is safe and harm-free. And then the, the, the other piece, I think it's really talks to some of the issues around historical injustice is to create um, a truth and reconciliation declarations in sport, through sport. And that is, that's in our strategy. Um, one of the aspects around that is around relief funding as well. So, you know, if you're looking at, uh, uh, you know, the storms that hit the Caribbean every year in terms of hurricanes or the, or the, or the typhoons that are you know, smashing up the islands in, in Oceania, you know, relief is a real <laughs> is a real concern in most uh, in most uh, small states and island states. And you know, what can we be doing to support those initiatives? But that reparative justice focus is equally as important as relief. 
because that's also about social identity and social empowerment. And, you know, how do we, again, respect, protect, promote, and power? You know, how do we address issues around the legacy of slavery um, through the power of sport? And, you know, and not be afraid of the conversation. You know, I think the current global discourse on racial equality gives us both the, the moral and social license to be, to be more open and, and, and more honest than ever before. And I think that that is, um, and expresses that sense of urgency because every moment we don't have those conversations, every moment we don't take an advocacy position or take action is an opportunity lost yeah. or potentially uh, an opportunity for someone to be harmed. And I think that's why, you know, I really feel that, you know, as a Commonwealth, as Commonwealth sport, um, we not only have an opportunity, but we have a responsibility. Um, and those are some of the meaningful actions that, you know, by 2022, um, you know, in Birmingham, I really want us to be considered a movement transform. Yeah, uh, <laughs> David, you use the word transform and you're considered as a transformation leader. Uh, you have gone out to, to agree that we can have protest at the at the games. Um, this is against what many other sporting organizations would agree, particularly because they have forever said that they don't want any political activism in, in games. What made you make this pronouncement and how do you think that this will help athletes um, in, in making a statement at games and just their own advocacy? I mean, I think you know, certainly over the past several months, you know, really with the uh, amplification of uh, Black Lives Matter um, and, the, and the global discourse on racial equality, of course, the platform of uh, this discussion around uh, athlete activism through sport has once again emerged. Now, it goes, it's part and parcel. Uh, and we have had a number of cases in which people said, but if you open Pandora's box, um, you'll never be able to put a lid on this. And, and I think what's important is that the game, the game that we are part of is not about politicizing sport, it's about humanizing sport. And I think when we have, you know, we're not gonna allow people to use a platform for hate but we will you know, allow people to use a platform for peace, sustainability, prosperity, addressing, um, ar addressing issues around freedom, fairness, equality, and justice. And I think that that is peaceful protest, the right of, uh, and, and also the, 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 the right of association and right to free speech are inalienable human rights. And I think from that perspective, we felt that we, we couldn't say one thing and act differently on another. Now, is it simple? No. But if we can create a platform, if we can create a, a movement that not only is an opportunity for activism, but advocacy and a sense of belonging and a sense of identity, that almost, uh, and, and how people define that, if people define that as protest or simply one of the other four things I just mentioned, you know, I, I put up a post recently with Kathy Freeman, uh, who in 1994 at the Victoria Games had herself wrapped in the Aboriginal flag with the, with the Australian flag. Now, I put the question, question marks, identity, question mark, belonging, question mark, advocacy, question mark, activism, question mark, or protest, question mark, you decide. Yeah. And the point is, is that, you know, one person's activism may be another one's protest. You know, I think it's, it's about providing a platform where people feel that they're part of a movement that is truly, you know, empowering, impactful, and stands for, for, for what they believe in and, and what they identify with. You know, you, you achieve your greatest when you can be who you are. And, 
we should be creating um, a sport movement that allows athletes to be who they are. Mm. Uh, one of our good friends, David, uh, Brian Lewis out of Trinidad, uh, he's coordinating uh, a youth games for you. <laughs> well, yes. It's Commonwealth, games, Commonwealth Youth Games. And, and that That's for right. you has been uh, an important part of the, the movement, hasn't been. Uh, has it been? And uh, to what extent will you be able to manage these challenges now to host a games that is now postponed? Yeah, it, it's, it, it has been certainly uh, challenging because of, uh, because of COVID, because of the, 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 the movement of the, uh, the Olympic Games, uh, which is now directly uh, uh, yeah. competing uh, in terms of the, the, the time slot on the international calendar. Um, so a couple of months ago, Dame Louise, our, our, our president, um, and the Honorable uh, Sports Minister from uh, Trinidad and Tobago uh, had discussions around the, the potential postponement of those games into 2023, um, which the, uh, I think following um, the elections in Trinidad and Tobago, I think a decision will be rendered hopefully in, uh, in September. Uh, but the, but the, I think really the key the key, and this uh, is, is that we, we run a games that are uh, impactful for the community um, and really resonate on the full potential of, uh, of, of youth empowerment in the Commonwealth. And uh, that needs to be, you know, that's certainly the, the leadership and vision of uh, Brian Lewis and, and, and the entire Trinidad and Tobago uh, uh, sports community has been around really creating a game changer moment, um, you know, from from Trinidad and Tobago and, and ensuring that the two islands really, you know, show this. Now, what we've done over the past uh, few editions of the, of the games, um, we've been taking the games to small states and island states. So we've yeah. gone to Samoa, we went to Bahamas. You know, this is a way of, of, of bringing um, the power of these events to, uh, you know, to, to, to small states and island states and, uh, you know, really giving a hosting opportunity and, and, and really show, show, showcasing the real distinct um, value that small states and island states play in the world and contributing. And, and the things that we've learned and the things that have resonated from, from these states is just, you know, it, it's, it's been absolutely amazing and, I, th and I, I, I honestly think that Trinidad and Tobago will certainly be no different in terms of it's you know it's such a it's such a cultural melting pot I mean I have to say having having um, having doubles uh, <laughs> is is honestly has turned into I think one of my favorite uh, uh, yeah. uh, favorite snacks <laughs> so I, can't, I can't wait to go back and uh, or uh, or scorpion pepper as well, you know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> these, are some of the, these are some of the unique, uh, I think, unique experiences people will, will, will have and enjoy when they when they. And, and Brian was a great host, wasn't he? Never, never better. <laughs> <laughs> he's, he's an amazing host. He's an amazing host. Uh, the, the the warmth, um, the warmth of his welcome um, at a, in a wonderful place. You know, I, I, I'm really excited and, and really hope we can pull this, uh, pull this event off. Um, and, I, and again, it'll be the first youth games that we've hosted in the Caribbean. Um, you know, uh, Ameri uh, we've considered Bahamas uh, as part of uh, the Americas region, but uh, I think Bahamas uh, also has, a, has, a, has close ties with the Caribbean as well. But um, it, it's, uh, it's a bit of an identity crisis. <laughs> yeah. Uh, but, no, what but, but I... Yeah, go ahead. Sorry. No, 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 no. I, I, I was just saying. Yeah, they, they, they are part of the the Caricom region. Um, I agree. Yeah. <laughs> but yeah. they, they, they do have their. I won't call it challenges, but they have, they have tied themselves a lot to the to northern, um, to yeah, the US. North American. Yeah, yeah. North America. So I'll, I'll, I'll leave that part out for now. But, but I think Trinidad would be a fantastic host. Uh, what was the experience for you in terms of Bahamas 2017? You probably don't remember, but I actually interviewed you, um, I think the opening day of that games, uh, yeah. <laughs> as, uh, as part of the team there doing commentary. It's, I, I mean, the, 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 you know, coming, coming from New Orleans, the more I realize how 
connected culturally um, you know the Caribbean is to itself um, and the, the, the diversity in uh, representation and and you know just just that cultural diversity is just so rich it, it provides such a distinct and unique experience I think uh, you know Bahamas was uh, just a wonderful kind of recognition you know of yeah. A completely different experience than Samoa, and a completely different experience from Pune and in India or Isle of Man. <laughs> you know, one of the small crown dependencies off the coast of uh, of, of the uh, of, uh, Great Britain, um, which were a couple of games before. Uh, you know, Bahamas was was a you know I think just a, a wonderful experience of just sh showcasing you know the love of sport. Um, how sport tourism plays a, plays a role uh, in in the success of, of, of the regions, the experience that the athletes uh, had, the experience that the the, the, the fans uh, had, was was absolutely um, you know I think very defining, very positive, um, empowering. We we run a number of uh, kind of workshops and programs uh, that that talk about commonwealth values and get kids uh, discussing you know for for example one of the things that trinidad and tobago that we we uh, we had as part of the bid and part of the intentions is to launch the event on the first of august emancipation day to have a broader conversation on our hist historical perspectives and our shared history um and that was something that was quite important in terms of uh, broadening people's views. So I think when you bring a games to Bahamas, Trinidad and Tobago, you have a very unique, distinct experience that you get nowhere else in the world, which really helps us accentuate and amplify that, that value. And that's, uh, that's something that uh, just because you're a small island state doesn't mean you don't have a lot to offer uh, the world. And that's what we're all about. We're about amplifying that, showcasing that, and really embracing and encouraging that. And, and we need to do that uh, with and part of our part of our communications and marketing strategies now are telling the stories of our small states and island states, you know, and, and um, really showcasing, you know, their, their place in their world, their, you know, their anxieties and their ambitions and, and how we use the power of sport to, to tackle that. But I can tell you, you know, uh, the Bahamas were a fantastic host, um, and we had a, you know, we had a fantastic, uh, fantastic event there, and and the feedback from the, the teams was uh, was outstanding. Uh, talking about youth and youth development, uh, David, oh, I, I did a webinar um, a, a few days ago talking about safeguarding children in sport. Yes. And I, I wondered if you wouldn't mind talking to me about some of the initiative that you think that you'll be putting in place in terms of safeguarding children in sport and the role that the CGF has in this regard. Yeah, I mean, I think when we run events, I think first and foremost, we, we, have, a, we have a responsibility to, to bring, bring about awareness, advocacy and, and take action um, to create harm free environments you know, uh, stand down. That's, uh, that's absolutely uh, a, a commitment, uh, but also a, a part of our fundamentals. Over the past several years, we've, we've worked with UNICEF, um, which is obviously one of the, the uh, global, uh, lead global charities on, um, on uh, child uh, safeguarding, child rights, uh, and child empowerment. And we have, in each of our organizing committees, uh, we help to develop uh, a, a strong safeguarding policies, but we also do training programs uh, to train safeguarding professionals. So we, tra we train 75 safeguarding professionals in the Bahamas, which now has, last, uh, has, uh, has a lasting legacy in terms of how events are being run in the Bahamas. Yeah. You know, and that's, and, and now in terms of, having that eye and focus as you're planning on issues around the protection of vulnerable people and the preventative aspects. But it's about having the preventative measures in place, but also having issues around remedy and doing whatever you can to change, uh, you know, to, 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 to change um, situations that could be or have been uh, harmful 
to people. And you know, every every community is different, and everyone yeah. every community has, you know, has um, things it doesn't like to talk about that it should, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Um, and we and we we kind of force some of those conversations by the nature of running these weird and wonderful events that bring the public, private, and and third sector together, like not like not like nothing else does. Yeah. So, yeah. But but we are absolutely one hundred percent committed to, to to safeguarding. It's part of our our human rights uh, strategy and implementation work. Um, it's uh, and, and particularly for children and vulnerable people. You know that is, uh, you know, we're we're only as, uh, you know, we're we're only as strong um, as as we're able to effectively, you know, protect people. And that's uh, you know, that's that's certainly not only a commitment, but uh, we see we also see it as an opportunity. Uh, our good friend again, uh, Brian, keep on saying that the future of sport is women. Uh, it's it said that women's rights is human rights. Uh, talk to us about some of what the, the initiatives that, that, that you see the CJ putting in place and, and how do you advance women's uh, empowerment in the movement as it regards to sport? Well, I have to say we've, we've taken huge steps in the past five years. Um, we had uh, in Gold Coast, we were the first games to have uh, an equal number of uh, women's events to men's events um, in terms of medal, medal event opportunities. Um, we've now for 2022, we have more women's events than men's events. Um, <laughs> so I think some of the men are saying, hey, wait a second, we've got to get the time has changed. Um, but it's great. It's a, I think it's a great, I think it's, you know, it's, it's uh, indicative of the value that women's events are providing in the Commonwealth as well, and women's sport and the growth of women's sport. Um, we also have, uh, have made some fundamental changes to our governance uh, uh, structures. Uh, you, you know that uh, we're one of the few international federations to, to have uh, a, a, a president who is a woman, um, but we also have 48% uh, of our board uh, has female representation um, as well. Um, there have been some major changes to our to uh, to 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 ensure that within our constitution, both for our uh, our executive board and representation at our general assembly um, as well. So again, these are steps of trying to put our money our, our money where our mouth is or our, uh, walk the talk. Um, and you know, I think there there's and there's there's more to do. Um, in terms of encouraging, uh, you know, girls and women to to, to feel comfortable in participating and 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 addressing, you know, uh, the traditional patriarchal hierarchies that have been so prevalent in in sport and 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 generally ensure that more women are are not only represented but but represented but but being empowered to to take leadership roles and, you know, that that ultimately gives us greater diversity in thought greater diversity in reflection and conversation and, and also gives us a much, much better um, opportunity to deliver uh, you know, products, services, uh, opportunities that, that really uh, have more meaning and, and are representative of everyone. So, you know, I, it's, a, it's, ex, it's an exciting place that we're committed to, to committed to to, to pushing forward, but it's it's interesting. Over the past five years, it's really become a part of our DNA, and not yeah. not an add-on. You know, it's just kind of who we yeah. are. Uh, David, you've been CEO for one of the most interesting time for the for the movement. Uh, whether it's a pandemic, yeah. you've you've been managing a pandemic in planning two major games. <laughs> you, yes. You, uh, the Black Lives Matter, social injustices, advocacy, everything is happening right around your time. H how have you been managing that as, as a leader? You know, and what are some of the things we can expect for you uh, in the future? Well, you know, there's, there's, you know, there's, some people uh, are paralyzed by the fire. Some people run away from the fire. Some people run up to the fire and play with <laughs> it. I tend to run right into the fire and, and try to make it work. Um, you know, it's... The, all of these things, um, first and foremost, remind us that we are in the business of creating people's proudest moments. 
And in doing that, we need to create, treat people as people you know, with absolute respect. And we need to create environments that are welcoming and that people feel valued, both in terms of how they adapt and access, access those environments, but, but also uh, how uh, they're, they are generally included in terms of the, the, the language that we use and the, and the experiences that we create. And when you look at all of those elements, I mean, if you look at the, the impact of COVID, if you look at the, the social discourse around racial equality, these are all reminders of the honesty that we need to have within ourselves and with others when we when we work through these projects, whether they are urgent uh, things that are long overdue and need to be need to be handled swiftly. We're not. It's not about just what we uh, what decisions um, I make, but how I make those decisions uh, and how swiftly I make those decisions. You know, and I think that's the thing I've certainly have reflected and learned from as part of this, uh, I would say, challenging time, defining time, but but important time um, as well. And I, I couldn't feel luckier to be in the role that I, I have right now, um, both in terms of the perspectives I'm gaining, but also the sense of resp responsibility I feel for the people that I, I, I seek to represent and serve. And you know, I just, I hope I'm doing justice to the way that people feel um, needs to be done. Um, and, uh, you know, I continue to, it, despite me speaking a lot on this, uh, uh, on this podcast, I really yeah. <laughs> I feel that some of the key, the key things is to respect, listen, and learn, not just hear someone so you can state your, your view, but really listen and learn you know, and then, and then contribute, you know, and I think that's really important. I've learned a lot. I've listened a lot, but I've learned a, an enormous amount over this period. And I'll continue to, to be a student of, uh, of, of the Commonwealth and a, and a student to, to people. Amazing. Isn't David, it, it's, I, I won't take up no more, no much more of your time, but it's, it's always great uh, oh, chatting with you, you certainly on these, on these subjects. Um, a lot more for us to discuss and interrogate, but I'm sure we'll get another opportunity to do that. My pleasure, and, and, and absolutely, I look forward to it. And thank you so much for for uh, inviting yeah. me on the on the show. I really uh, really appreciate it, and it's uh, it's always a pleasure to see you, Dalton. Yeah, man. Say hi to Zane for me, and and he has been great. Thank you, man. Thank you so much. Take care of yourself. Yeah, you too. So, on on behalf of our producer Rashika Grant, Marsha, program advisor. Uh, and the entire production team, thanks for joining us on this episode of the Drive Viz podcast.